Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Public Health, Environment, Civil Rights, and Engagement Committee for March 2nd, 2020. My name is Philippe Cunningham, and I am the chair of this committee. Joining me at the dais are Council Members Johnson and Schrader, Council Vice President Jenkins, and Vice Chair Gordon. Please let the let record reflect that we have a quorum and can conduct the business of this committee. Colleagues, we have two consent agenda items um, and then one walk on discussion item. So um, let's go ahead and go through the consent agenda and we will move on to the discussion item. So on our consent agenda, we have authorizing a grant application to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, SAMHSA Center for the Strategic Prevention Framework Partnership for Success Grant and the amount of $1.5 million to $5 million for a five-year period starting August uh, 30th, 2020 through August, 20, or August 30th, 2025 to present, prevent the onset and reduce the progression of substance abuse and its related problems. Item number two is accepting an additional $5,000 in statewide health improvement partnership funds from the Minnesota Department of Health for walkable community workshop action plan implementation at Glendale townhomes by the city council in its capacity as a community health board. I move approval of those two items. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and that item carries. Now, colleagues, we'll be moving on to the walk-on discussion item, uh, which is uh, the Office of Violence Prevention. Today they're going to be discussing the tertiary component of violence prevention. So I will welcome up Director Cotton. Uh, we will be welcoming up Josh Peterson, manager of the Office of Violence Prevention, to get us kicked off. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members. Uh, my name is Josh Peterson. I'm the manager of the Office of Violence Prevention here. You've heard a lot from Director Cotton over the past few weeks, so we thought we would give you a new voice for a little bit of time here. Uh, but as you can see from the slides, once they're up on the screen, we do have a number of other speakers that are going to be joining me throughout the presentation here today. Um, I also want to acknowledge Ellen Shi from our staff. She had a big role in putting these slides together for us and did a great job, so I, I thank her for that. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to provide a brief overview about our public health approaches to violence prevention, really just sort of provide some context um, for what we mean when we say public health approaches to violence prevention, because that's going to inform this presentation and also some future presentations we do for you all. And that's going to segue into talking about what we mean when we say tertiary prevention. Um, and then lastly, we're going to spotlight some of our tertiary prevention efforts we have in the Office of Violence Prevention and then across the city enterprise. So some context to get you all grounded. Um, when we talk about public health approaches to violence prevention, that really means a lot of different things, but there is sort of one kind of textbook definition of what that means. And so this diagram you see here is from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And really it says that um, public health approach is a systematic and scientific approach that is, consists of four steps. And so the four steps you see here are define the problem, so the who, what, when, where, why, how of the issue. And then once that's done, identifying risk and protective factors, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. And then the next step is developing novel prevention strategies and testing those strategies. So what can we come up with that's going to help us address those risk and protective factors? And then do they work? Because we want to only be doing things, ideally, that work. And then the final step is a sure widespread adoption. So once we've figured out what works as far as novel prevention strategies, how can we get those in front of as many people as possible? Novel, yes. Yeah. So novel strategies being something new, something potentially innovative. Um, and, and that's not to say that every strategy that works is a novel strategy. There are plenty of tried and true evidence-based strategies as well. Thank you for that question, Mr. Chair. So I briefly mentioned risk factors and protective factors. Just to give a quick definition of that, um, when we talk about violence prevention, what we're really often talking about is um, preventing the conditions or factors that may lead to violence. So when we talk about risk factors, we can talk about things like biological factors or personal history, all the way up to sort of societal level factors around policy and inequities. So the risk factors then are those factors that may increase likelihood of involvement with violence. And on the flip side, protective factors are those things that buffer against the risk of violence. And one thing I really want to emphasize here is that um, people in communities are more than their risk factors. So we talk about risk and protective factors as a useful way to think about interventions and designing programs. But it's really important to understand that we aren't, 
we need to not define individuals and communities by their risk factors. Folks are more than the risk factors that they have. So when we talk about public health approaches, I mentioned that that means a lot of different things to us. Um, something that I think is really key is that when we think about violence as a public health issue, we're sort of contextualizing it alongside other communicable, pu communicable public health issues. So these are things that we can protect against, prevent, and treat. Um, and I think that's really important because it helps remind us that violence is not inevitable. So I think often folks think of violence as that's something that's sort of this intractable issue in communities that we can't do anything about. And if we think about it in terms of a communicable disease and thinking about it in terms of how we can protect against it and treat it, it really provides sort of a sense of hope and a framework um, that I think is really valuable. Another thing that's important about the public health approach is the idea that there are many factors that contribute to violence. So violence is not just uh, sort of the actions of quote unquote bad people doing bad things, but really social conditions matter. Um, you see here a framework called the social ecological model, which is split out in the, in the different levels, individual, relationship, community, and societal. And basically what that says is that um, violence is impacted by all of these levels. So it can be impacted just as much by personal character traits or uh, personal histories as societal level factors around policy, uh, the relationships that people hold and the communities in which those relationships exist. So really thinking about the broad societal factors that may impact violence. Another piece about the public health approach that I think is really important is this idea that violence is often a cycle. So the research says, and we know from our experience, that often when someone is hurt, they're more likely to be hurt again. And so there's this cyclical nature around hurt people hurting people and hurt people being hurt again. And so really in this work, we think a lot about how we can support people on a path toward healing and away from perpetuating violence that they may have encountered. Um, we think it's, a re it's really important to sort of interrupt that cycle of violence. So just as there are many factors that lead to violence within this approach, there are also many approaches. So I think a key thing about the public health approach is there isn't one single answer. It's not a, an approach, it's many approaches. So we really need to think about sort of, um, you know, one, not one solution, but rather sort of this complex, multifaceted solution that involves lots of different angles and lots of different things. Um, and there's sort of, there are a number of conceptual frameworks that kind of talk about this. So I'm going to run through a couple of those briefly to get us into what we're talking about today. The first is this idea of upstream and downstream. So this is not unique to violence prevention. We see this across public health and across disciplines. And I'm sure you all have seen it before. So I'm not really going to spend a whole lot of time talking about what upstream versus downstream means. But I think this is a really um, valuable graphic because it really sort of draws a tangible line from upstream factors like structural violence to downstream manifestation of youth violence. This was put together by some colleagues at the Youth Violence Prevention Research Center in Louisville. Um, and, and we think it's a really valuable way to sort of illustrate why we think about big picture topics when we're talking about stopping violence on the ground. Another way we think about it in terms of public health approaches is this idea of the prevention continuum. So thinking about um, violence, up, preventing violence up front, so before it happens, thinking about um, preventing it before it occurs and sort of laying the groundwork to prevent things. And then in the thick, which is sort of either early intervention for folks who are most at risk or the um, responses to immediate threats of violence. And then aftermath, which is responding sort of after violence has occurred to try and promote healing and restoration. So this is a model that is talked, to often, um, talked about often by a woman named Deborah prothrow stith who is an early pioneer in the field of uh, violence prevention and public health. She was a physician in Boston and actually started the first um, Office of Violence Prevention in the State Public Health Department. And so she sort of has pioneered this approach, which has stuck within this discipline for a long time. And then finally, we get to the prevention pyramid. Um, so the, the continuum sort of aligns with this pyramid, and this pyramid is going to lay the groundwork for our conversation about tertiary today, as well as some future presentations about primary and secondary. So I want to talk a little bit about it. Um, you'll see at the bottom we have primary prevention at the base of the pyramid, and that is sort of akin to the um, upfront from the continuum. This is things that lay the groundwork to prevent violence from happening. And I think the pyramid is useful in that it visualizes that sort of the base is for everybody. So this covers sort of the fabric of society. This is meant to cover the whole swath of community. Jumping up a level then is secondary prevention, and that's for um, folks who are potentially a little bit more at risk. That's more early intervention, and that's for a smaller subset of folks. And then at the top, we have tertiary prevention, which is sort of that aftermath piece from the continuum. And so as you can probably intuit from the nature of a pyramid diagram, um, tertiary is at the top, which means it typically is sort of focused on the smallest subset of folks. Uh, it is typically downstream. 
And this is really about interrupting that cycle of violence. So it's about protecting those who've been hurt from being hurt again and protecting those who may have perpetrated violence uh, from, from committing violence again. And again, it's highly focused typically on a small sub subset of individuals. And so today when we talk about our tertiary prevention efforts, this is where we're gonna focus. And again, we're gonna talk about primary and secondary in some future presentations to you all. So you made it through the Public Health 101. Congratulations, thank you for paying attention. Now we get to talk about the work we do and hear, some from, hear from some folks who are doing the work. Um, briefly, I just wanna point out that there are a number of tertiary prevention efforts from across the enterprise. So in the OVP, we have Project Life and Next Step, but there are things happening in the city attorney's office, in animal, cruelty, or animal control, in many of employment and training, in the police department, and more. And so you see a whole host of those here. Um, and today we're gonna to invite some folks up from our Office of Violence Prevention Initiatives to talk about a few of the things that they do. So we're gonna start with Next Step, which is our hospital-based violence intervention program. Um, and this really started back in 2014 when I reached out to folks at HCMC saying we wanna get a program like this off the ground, trying to rekindle some conversations that had happened previously that never really got moving. And luckily enough, HCMC said, we're thinking the same thing, let's make this happen. So fast forward to 2016 and we launched at HCMC and then in 2018 expanded to North Memorial. Um, and so we've been able to make a, a whole lot of change in both of those hospitals and really throughout the community since then. So today we're joined by Contrell Galloway and Farji Shahir. Contrell is the program manager of Next Step for Hennepin Healthcare. And Farji is a violence intervention specialist who actually has been with the program since before the first participant was even enrolled in the program. So really understands what it meant to, to get the program rolling and what it has meant to serve folks throughout. So I'm happy to welcome them. I'm gonna hand it over to them and they'll give you some words. Thank you, welcome. If you can introduce yourself for the record, that'd be appreciated, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, City Councilmen. My name is Contrell Galloway. I'm the program manager over at Hennepin Healthcare for Next Step. Um, it is a hospital-based violence prevention program through a collaboration through the city with uh, Hennepin Healthcare, who um, help. Uh, um, sorry, I'm getting a little nervous. Uh, who help uh, participants who come into the hospital victims of gun violence? So. Um, the, the program starts when we have victims who come into the hospital, like I said, as victim of gun violence or some type of uh, violent assault. And then once they come into the hospital, I have a team of what we'll call hospital responders and case managers who will then go and meet the patient right as they're coming into the hospital. Um, my, there's two stages to our program. The first stage is the hospital base where we meet with the patients as they're, like I said, coming into the hospital. Um, we meet with the families. We meet with the patients. We assign them with the program. We make sure that they're getting the best possible care through the hospital because sometimes there's a stigmatism on folks who are victims of gun violence. And then the second part is when we when they um, discharge from the hospital, then my team will follow them out in the community, and then we try to help them get back on their feet and get some type of normalcy, even though, you know, that really doesn't help us sometimes if you're a victim of gun violence. But we help them with housing, transportation, food, uh, helping them find work. Um, and the people who do that are my case managers. And like he said, Farji Shahir is one of the people who has been with the program since the beginning, and he can talk more about what the case managers do on the ground work. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Council uh, Chair and Council Members. Um, pretty much, we've been making some improvements. Um, in the last two years, we expanded to North Memorial, in which we started uh, not only seeing the victims that came through Hennepin County, but also the victims that were coming through North Memorial. Um, what has happened is that even though Next Step has 437 participants, we've been able to connect uh, with their families and with the individuals who they associate themselves with outside. So that positive cancer that we once instilled in 2016 is now growing, and the individuals are actually following, following suit to uh, remain safe and to stay out of danger. Um, one of those prime examples would be in uh, 2018, I think our recidivism rate was at 3.5. And then uh, last year we did a count and it was down to 1.8. So um, out of the 437 individuals that we do service, um, there's only two individuals that have actually come back into the hospital with the same or similar wound. So this is a strategy that has been working. It's a strategy that has um, definitely gotten family members and community members involved in making sure that individuals remain safe while they're out in the community. Uh, true indeed, we do meet them inside the hospital at their most vulnerable moment. But the most impact that is um, 
been effective is when we actually are when I when we actually meet these individuals in their neighborhoods and meet the individuals that they hang with and meet the individuals that they go to the mall and um, you know play video games with out of the game works uh, we've developed a strong partnership with uh, tickets for kids who has been uh, extremely supportive in making sure that we have events and uh, activities so that the young individuals that we deal with uh, have something to do in their spare time versus just hanging out on Hennepin Avenue or riding the light rails. Uh, we also made a strong partnership with Journey Forward and, and Hired, who has been extremely supportive with uh, reaching out to our young individuals, making sure that they are uh, job ready and eliminating some of those barriers so that they can gain employment and gain the confidence to return to school to chase down other dreams. Um, there have been some barriers in regards to uh, some of the property. Uh, patient's property is, of course, confiscated when they are entering into the hospital and then individuals are not receiving their property back from the property room. So that has been one of the biggest uh, barriers that we've had, especially when individuals are um, victims of homicide and their family members want to gather their belongings so that they can make mementos out of their belongings. Uh, another barrier which we have been tackling is um, getting individuals to actually come forward with the names of the individuals that shot them. Uh, this barrier was a young man that was shot 10 times and he gave us the information to make sure that the person who shot them received justice, but unfortunately that individual is still free. So it has been creating a barrier in which uh, participants don't feel um, they don't trust us enough because the individuals that they tell on or give information about are still outside. And um, it's making it harder for us to come to the participants and ask them, you know, to help us get the individuals that are doing these kind of crimes off the streets if they feel as if they tell us nothing is ultimately going to happen. Those two barriers I think we possibly can work on. Another barrier was the fact that uh, there's a um, form inside of, the, inside of this building that says a person cannot receive their ID if they um, don't have somebody co-sign for them that has known them for two years. A lot of the individuals that we deal with are homeless. Um, they are not represented by family members and sometimes it's kind of difficult to find individuals that will vouch for these young people so that they can obtain proper identification so that they can then obtain proper housing and employment. Um, other than those barriers, the program has been extremely successful. Um, there's, there's been, um, you know, talk of reaching out to the community. We're actually going to get involved with Violence uh, Intervention Week uh, to kind of start creating different programs and, you know, different um, curriculum so that individuals can feel more comfortable coming into the circle of the collegiate crowd. Uh, we deal with individuals that are not very trusting of the system. So to be able to create uh, an atmosphere where they can be welcomed and accepted and then uh, also share their experiences without being judged will then propel us in the direction that we really need to go ultimately for the remaining of this year and hopefully next year. Um, but yeah, we're doing good. The work is working. Uh, individuals are staying safe. And once individuals actually meet the team inside of the hospital, they're not interested in coming back in uh, with the same or similar wound. And they actually come in frequently to, um, to gain guidance so that they can stay out of trouble and to stay safe. So it's working. Great. Thank you so much for all of your work. Okay. I have a question or comment from Council Member Gordon. Thank you. Really appreciate all that information. You shared a lot with us. I just wanted to double check a couple things and get some elaboration. So you talked a bit about the recidivism and you talked about 2018, I think. Yeah. And was that before we had the case managers in the emergency room? Uh, that was before we ex made the expansion with the team. So once we made the expansion, the recidivism actually dropped the, follow the following year, 2019. It went down to 1.8. Okay, so we already were working and we had it at 4% and we made some improvements and went to 1%. Yeah. And, so, and I'm a little bit interested in what is our... Uh, how bad would it be and how bad was it before we were doing anything, if anybody was even tracking that, and I'm not sure we were. I, um, the, the average rate was around 40% okay, nationally. 
Mr. Chair, Councilmember Gordon. Um, yeah, so the, the research says that the five-year the five year rate nationally is about 40%. Obviously, that's an apples to oranges comparison because Next Step hasn't been on the ground for five years. Uh, we don't have any data from prior to when Next Step was launched locally. But so even recognizing that it's an apples to oranges comparison, looking at something like 3% compared to 40%, we feel is a, is a pretty strong win. Appreciate that, and I'm glad that we had that information. You also listed a number of barriers. Um, I think there were three big things that you talked about. Yes. Property. Um, not following through in terms of investigations to actually apprehend people who are identified, yes. and then a problem getting an ID. Yes. Is that getting your first ID or just getting an ID returned to you? Getting get, getting their first ID. Okay, so that is that's yeah. challenging. You're going to need a school. I, I, yep, I, I've had kids go through that process. You need a few things, so that's important to hear. With and the other two issues, are you talking to um, health department or police department about that? And is it the hospital that's keeping their property, or is it the police that are keeping their property? It's, it's the police department. And do you have a relationship with somebody in the police department so they're aware of this barrier and they're working with you on it? I've, I've reached out to several of the investigators, but unfortunately we haven't been able to make any real progress. Um, I have a family who has been uh, without their loved one's belongings for over three years now. And are they saying because they need them for a current investigation? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and in, in terms of the other issue of of investigating to make an arrest of somebody, I'm sure that gets very complicated, but I hope you also are communicating that with the police department and also with other health department staff. It, um, that's, I think that's a concern that everybody shares, and we totally understand how we're not gonna have witnesses coming forward if they don't think that they're, um, you know, there's gonna be some effective response yeah. to that. So thank you very much. Appreciate all the work that you and your team are doing out there. No problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, truly, for everyone all the hard work that you all put in phenomenal work this really means a lot to our community so thank you so much thank you mr chair so next we're going to welcome up mary ellen hang from the city attorney's office um, one thing we really appreciate about appreciate about the office of violence prevention is it really gives us the opportunity to work across the city enterprise not just within the health department and so the pathways to a new beginning program is really a great example of how there are great violence prevention things happening elsewhere so i'm excited to hear more about that Welcome. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Mary Ellen Hang. I'm the criminal deputy in the Minneapolis City Attorney's Office. We started the Pathways program uh, almost three years ago now. May of two, 2017 is when we launched. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, my office prosecutes gross misdemeanor gun offenses, so things like carrying a pistol without a permit, carrying a rifle or a BB gun in public. Those are the main two offenses, and for a while, I had a team of three prosecutors who were focusing on these cases, so they handled all of them. And one of my prosecutors, Zenaida Chico, came to my office one day and she said, you know, I don't really know if this is accurate, but it seems like every time I go to court, it seems to be a young person, 18 to maybe 25, 26, and a young African-American male. It seems like that's all we're prosecuting. And, and so it kind of got Susan Siegel, our former city attorney, and I thinking, um, and we didn't know if that's really what the data showed. So I went back through all of our cases since I started tracking in 2007. And sure enough, the majority of the defendants we prosecuted were between 18 and 30. And the majority of them were young African-American males in that demographic. So then I decided to look and see, wonder what happened since we convicted them of this offense. And in my informal research, over 70% of those individuals went on to commit uh, some sort of new crime. Most of them committed some sort of new felony. A lot of them were violent felonies, robberies, uh, high-level drugs, not just the fifth degrees, the second degree drugs, murder charges. A lot of them were in prison before they were 30. And so we got talking and thought, well, our little point of intervention where we're prosecuting them, we're getting a conviction 98% of the time, they're doing a little bit of jail time, we're clearly not doing anything to help this issue. So we wondered if we could do better. So we put out an RFP and we'd met with some people and that's when the issue of focusing on the trauma that these individuals may have experienced that might lead them to carry their weapon was first put in our head and something kind of clicked for me and I'm like, I think that might be the piece we're missing. So fast forward to we do a contract with Urban Ventures for our partners, and they developed our Pathways program, which we launched in May of 2017. Um, 
it's been an incredible program, in my opinion, and looking back at what we've done so far in almost these three years. Uh, our goal was to basically reduce recidivism, not just among gun offenses, but among all offenses for the individuals that we were coming into contact on these offenses. Because the other piece that Ms. Chico mentioned that got us thinking about this was in almost all of the cases when the person was interviewed by the investigator, they would say, I, I found the gun, I got the gun from a friend. The bottom line was they were carrying it for protection. They felt they needed that because they were worried for themselves or their family. It wasn't as if they were saying, I was carrying it because I wanted to go out and commit some violent act. It was that self-preservation. Um, so we launched our program. When we launched it initially, because it's a gun offense, we wanted to give somewhat of a, you know, a carrot and a stick approach, a reason to do the programming. Um, but we initially still required a conviction and we were not getting a lot of individuals interested in participating. So we pivoted in September and we decided to take a risk. And now people come into the program on what's called a stay of adjudication. So they admit to the facts, but the conviction kind of stays in the cloud. So you, so you will, they don't have a conviction on their record. And if they participate and they graduate after two years, their case is completely dismissed. They've never had a criminal conviction for a gross misdemeanor case. And now the new piece that we've just added is the law requires them to wait for one more year. But at that point, we're going to assist these individuals in getting expungements, assuming that they haven't uh, committed something that you know would make us not want to do that, say, like a domestic violence or a felony or something like that. Um, so once we started offering it as basically a pre-conviction path, the, the doors opened and we started getting all these individuals going through the program. Um, and initially people were very successful. And then we found, I was starting to get contacted by the program that some people were kind of dropping off and we were filing probation violations. And when I looked at them, I realized they were all well into our second phase of the programming. So I called up Priscilla, who is our main contact. And I said, what's going on? And she said, it's it's too long. It's It's too onerous. They're starting to actually integrate back into normal lives and they're forgetting to contact us and we have to violate them. So again, we pivoted again, we modified the curriculum and now we're seeing much less people needing a probation violation tweak to kind of complete the program. They're able to go and complete it all the way through. So it's been really interesting uh, to work through that and find a piece of programming that actually works for the individual and achieves what we're trying to achieve. The program is basically two phases. The first phase is 12 weeks in length, about 67 hours of programming. The second is three to six months, depending on what the individual needs, anywhere from six or seven hours a week to maybe up to 15. Um, to date, we have reviewed 228 cases and we have found 144 individuals eligible. We've had 31 successfully graduate from the program. Uh, the first graduation was back in July of 2018. I went and just on uh, Thursday or Wednesday or Thursday last week when Josh contacted me, I looked up all 31 individuals to see what their recidivism was, and it's about 7%. Um, so much, much improved from what we were seeing before our programming. And of that, only one new gun offense. Uh, there's been a couple of domestics and a couple of low-level drug felonies. Uh, but overall, when you when you look at what was happening, to me, that just screamed success, that something is working, uh, which is great. Um, majority of our individuals are males, um, and the majority are African-American, which, again, fits with what we were seeing. So we're still seeing that, but this is a different way to address these issues. And, uh, and I think it's that holistic approach of really realizing there's much more going on with these individuals than just simply them walking around with a gun. Uh, so... It's one of the things I'm most proud of that we've done in our career. And as we're doing this further and we're seeing now the results and we're able to look at recidivism, seeing the impact, uh, we're seeing that something like this is working. And it wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't gotten the funding. The thing that makes this work is that we bear the cost of this because this would be, I mean, it's an expensive program. There's no way some of these individuals would ever be able to be afforded that opportunity. And I think that's a really great thing that has been put in our budget and it's you know, in the long run, we're going to save money because we're hopefully never going to have these people back in the criminal justice system again. They're going to go on and lead very productive lives. It's been interesting to talk to them. It's impacting families. A lot of these young men brought their significant others, wives, girlfriends, whatever that was. They would be allowed to sit in and have the benefit of the programming, things that we never thought 
would happen. Uh, I've had several reach out to me individually to ask me for assistance on things. Again, something I never would have thought would happen that someone would reach out and say, could you assist me with this? And um, So yeah, I think, and it pairs really nicely with GVI. We've had a couple of individuals we put through pathways because we don't know what their juvenile history is. And it turns out they had some gang involvement and it became uh, unsafe for them to continue in the pathways program. We transitioned them into GVI, which was a better fit. And those two individuals are still on a path to success. Uh, and so it's been a nice pairing with the work the public health has done. If we find someone that maybe because of the past gang involvement isn't the right fit for pathways, we can send them over to GVI and still have success. Thank you for that information. I have a question or comment from Councilmember Gordon. Yeah, this is really wonderful and great news and you should be proud um, and your entire team should be for doing this and, and very innovative. I was curious a little bit about um, ineligible uh, and eligible. Yes. Um, what would make somebody ineligible for the program? Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member Gordon, um, if they have a prior felony within the last five years, we've actually changed our criteria. When we started, any felony made them ineligible and then we were seeing people we were turning away who maybe had a fifth degree eight or nine years ago and then nothing but this new gun charge. And so we thought about that and decided they should be allowed to do the program um, if they have a history of violence. Um, a lot of, we, we do have some individuals have a lot of history of domestic assault or felony level assaults. Uh, those are the kind of things that would make them ineligible. And then we're constantly looking at that because seeing the success it's having, I'm trying to narrow that ineligibility criteria because we, we want more and more people to be able to go through the program because it is uh, beneficial. We, we've had a couple individuals who were deemed ineligible because they also had an open fifth degree felony case. We let that case play out. They ended up getting diversion on their felony and then we let them into pathways because that's not technically conviction. So we're finding ways to kind of work with them because we find that's a really good pairing to be in our program, be working on the felony diversion. It's a nice match with the programming. Um, we're seeing a lot of success with some of some of those things as well. Well, that's good to hear because I would be worried about that and maybe this program wouldn't be the right program for some people if they're if they were dealing with more, or, um, but maybe something else would. So that c combination um, sounds good. I was kind of curious if we knew what kind of re recidivism rate there was for the ineligible versus the eligible too, which would tell us that, well, if we did something over here, um, it would really have much more benefit. Um, and we don't, well, yeah, I'm assuming we don't necessarily know that. Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member Gordon, uh, I don't know that, but it wouldn't be hard to find because I have uh, a database of every individual we, we screened. Um, we're going to have a summer intern. That might be a great research project for our summer intern. Um, the district court's actually helping us right now. Uh, this program is one of three being studied by the University of Chicago. Um, and out of that, they've wanted to know the kind of the official recidivism, not just necessarily my looking them up. So we've sent the district court the case numbers of every individual we've convicted of a gross misdemeanor weapons case uh, the three years prior, so 2014, 2015, and 2016, and they are running that information, and I hope to have that back soon, and I think it's going to be a much higher number than our 7%. Um, what I think makes this program interesting and why the University of Chicago picked it is most gun diversion programs across the country that are starting to kind of pop up in jurisdictions, they are looking at the felony level uh, cases. And what I think makes this unique is we're actually looking at individuals who are charged with a lower level gun offense in the hopes that we can prevent them from becoming felons and having that criminal history attached where then they have even more trouble finding jobs or housing. And so I think we're kind of what Josh said, we're, we're trying to move much more upstream in the hopes of having better results. And I think that's why our program is actually really unique. I think we're one of the first that really looks at this level of offense and tries to provide some programming in hopes of, you know, creating a better future. So one last thing. Um, you say 7%, but the slide says recidivism to date has been 22.5%. Oh, I'm sorry. 20, yes, seven individuals, 22%. Just, so, okay. yes, my apologies. I have that clarified. Thank my you. My apologies. Thank you so much. I will say that um, one of the things that I really appreciate about this program is that it organically came to came into being because of the fact that um, you and your staff, uh, the former city attorney, noticed a trend. 
Um, and one of the issues that we have within the system is the amount of harm that the system has caused. And if we go all the way back to the structural issues, it starts with racism. And so when we notice that um, it is disproportionately young black men who are being negatively impacted, and it goes all the way back to that structural racism, it's these sort of moments in which we begin the process of dismantling that. And that's really important because that really changes this. So this is a systems change, it's not a program. I think calling it just a program, um, while it's easier to be able to say it rather than big structural change, right? Like, but um, calling it a program really does not fully name how it's beginning that process of dismantling the systemic racism, particularly within the criminal justice system. And so, um, so I'm really grateful for that astute observation, as well as the adaptation of the program as you've gone along. Sometimes folks are like, we got the answers, we know how to do this, and if, and if the folk, the target community is not benefiting, then that is on them, right? Like it is their fault. And instead of having that orientation, there's a self-reflection that oftentimes systems do not have and um, of, hmm, something's not quite right here. We're not getting the results. What can we do better? And that is something that we want to be emulated across our municipality. And so, um, so thank you for being an example. Thank you for doing this work well. Um, a 22% in comparison to a 70% is monumental. And um, and I think that the further we go along, the more we will see that number go down um, because there are just so many other off ramps that we're creating along the way as well. So thank you for doing your part. This is a huge piece of it. And thank you for presenting. I have a question or comment from Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Cunningham, and I too really appreciate this work and, and the ability to kind of look at trends and, and step in and try to create change. I actually have a, um, a question for the previous um, presentation. Farhi, Farji was talking about, um, you know, people not being, having their property returned and over 20 years ago, I was working with, um, as an employment counselor, working with people on probation, and I was hearing the same challenges that people weren't getting their um, their IDs back, their other property, sometimes, you know, um, cash, jewelry, all of those kinds of things, but most importantly, their documentation. and. In in your opinion, initially when um, Council Member um, Gordon asked the question, it kind of sounded like maybe it was just the deceased folks that were not getting their property back. But I'm wondering, are survivors having the same kind of issue? And what do you think maybe this body can do to help um, remedy some of that? Because that's you don't have that documentation, as everybody in the room knows, you can't sort of move forward with, with anything, employment, housing, et cetera. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Council Chair, and thank you, Council Member, uh, Vice President Jenkins, for the question. Um, it is not only the deceased. All the participants are having a difficult time receiving their belongings back. Um, it can be their shoes. Um, in fact, one of the Next Steps logo is a gym shoe, and that was simply because when participants were coming in, their shoes were taken and they were, you know, put on the bus in those socks. So we would get them the gym shoes, and a significant amount of the budget goes towards making sure that they have adequate footwear to get home in. Um, there are participants who have been uh, involved in the program since the beginning, and they still haven't received any of their belongings back. And this is not only for the deceased, but individuals who are, you know, who have survived. Uh, especially when it comes to cash. So uh, unfortunately, there's another barrier where individuals from our community, they don't bank their money the way that they should, and sometimes they walk around with a significant amount of money. Uh, sometimes that money it could be for their rent. Um, sometimes that money is used for car payments, um, things of that nature. And once that money is confiscated, uh, it is inside the property room until 
the um, staff in the property room decides to release that in, uh, that property to those individuals. Um, their state IDs, their credit cards, things of that nature are also confiscated. And my biggest question is, um, you know, what is the purpose behind confiscating the state ID? Uh, if an individual is um, shot, there's, their wallet um, has no real significance towards the investigation, so why can't they receive their their wallet or their credit cards? These individuals still have bills to pay. They still have to get to work. They still have to prove and identify who they are when they go into establishments and also when they go to um, make purchases or get you know obtain housing. So it's been one of the biggest barriers um, that all of the participants face. And it, there have been cases where uh, I've tried to wait for the uh, police department to arrive at the emergency room just to try to talk them out of taking the individual shoes. Our young men wear Michael Jordans. Those mm -hmm. shoes are 200 plus dollars. I mean, we can't afford to replace all their Michael Jordans. So why can't we, you know, leave them their shoes? And, you know, that, that, that conversation happens inside the emergency room while the patient is being wheeled upstairs and they have absolutely no idea what's going on or why their belongings are being taken, even if they're not a, a suspect in these crimes. Is there a way to collect those items prior to police arriving? No, ma'am. Um, part of the procedure is when the patients do come in, uh, there are staff inside of the uh, stabilization room, I call it the gates of heaven. Um, they're there to bag and tag that property and then they hold on to it until the police arrive to uh, confiscate it and take it into evidence. Yeah, we need some kind of body to look into this issue. Yeah, um, I 100% agree. Thank you for that adi additional information. No Might be appropriate for us to discuss further or bring forward a staff direction at the Public Safety Committee um, so that we can dig into that more from the uh, police department mm -hmm. perspective. Thank you for that additional information. Thanks, Good. Mary Ellen. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sasha Cotton, the director of the Office of Violence Prevention. As my colleague said, you have heard from me a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful to be back here again before you, so thank you for your time. I'm here to talk about two of our initiatives that are considered tertiary and their project areas that prior to becoming the director, I maintained oversight for and continue to do so uh, due to staffing constraints. And so at this time, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the group violence intervention strategy, um, just giving a high level overview of what the project does and why it's so important to us. So GVI operates really on the pillar um, or on the practice of three pillars, looking at law enforcement, social service providers, and a community moral voice. All three of those parts of the project are essential to its function and is a really key and essential reason why it remains housed specifically in the city. So while we partner with a variety of community-based agencies, and you'll hear from one of them today, having it anchored in a place like the Office of Violence Prevention is essential because of the partnership with city stakeholders and system stakeholders like probation, law enforcement, and um, other entities that are government run. We do partner with John Jay College and the National Network for Safe Communities to operate GVI, also known as Project Life. Project Life is the name that our community partners came up with for GVI, and is also a really important um, earmarker because life stands for Lifestyles in Transition for Empowerment, and that is really what we are about. We are trying to empower the people who come into the network to receive services, which is the social service aspect of the work, to change their lifestyles and really feel empowered to make changes, recognizing that it's a transition and not something that happens overnight, but that takes time and guidance and a lot of uh, effort on the part of the people who are doing that work. And so um, that's just a little high, high level overview of what we do. I wanna thank and give a shout out to our partners of the Minneapolis Police Department who are the essential partner in the law enforcement cavity of the work as, as well as Hennepin County Probation and to some degree the County Attorney's Office. They're a strong partner as well. Uh, Matt St. George, the Lieutenant of the Gang Unit is here um, with us to just mirror the support that MPD offers as well as that um, very important partnership in getting the work done 
done. As it pertains to law enforcement, their role really is to be a key messenger. They are often having a lot of contact with the people that we want to make sure know that services exist. And that is a real pivot from the way that law enforcement normally does its work and requires a change in thinking about how law enforcement engages with community. Normally, we know that law enforcement is seen as just that enforcement. And our gang unit absolutely does a lot of enforcement. That is the number one priority in their work. But they are also regularly and routinely delivering the GVI message to people about the social services and the fact that we care about them, that the law enforcement community, the city, and community really are invested in this model and wanting to see people safe, alive, and free. And so I just want to open that venue in that way because I think it really has been an instrumental part of why GBI has been quite successful, is that we have a gang unit and that our gang unit is well-trained and well-vested in uh, the model and delivering that message, even when it may not always feel good. You know, it doesn't always feel good. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm getting over not anything serious. <laughs> Just a little cough. I work in public health. I would stay home <laughs> if I was too, health, too sick to be here. Um, but I think it is important to highlight um, the partnership and how important the partnership is and how, to your point, um, Council Chair Cunningham or Committee Chair Cunningham, that we are talking about systems change. And so something like that really is asking systems to think about the way that they do their work different and do it differently. Next slide, please. So looking at um, our shooting rates over the years that we've been doing GBI, we look um, and take a retrospective look at 2016 as a base year because we were not doing GBI that year. Um, and you can see the number that we primarily focus on is group members who have been involved in a non-fatal shooting. And the reason that that is really important is because the number of bullets flying around in a community really impact the level of safety that people feel. And so we often put an emphasis on homicide and often, I mean, and ab absolutely the loss of life is something that's important and that we want to reduce. But sometimes the number of shots fired and the number of people impacted by a shooting can get overlooked because there's not a loss of life. And we know how those deeply affect the person who's been shot, but also the community where those shootings happen have a deep sense of insecurity when the number of shootings are so high. And so in our demonstration year prior to GVI, we experienced um, between call-ins. So we look strategically in May and September because that's the time frame in which we're in between call-ins, which is a method of communicating the GVI message that I think many of you are familiar with. It's where we identify a group of folks that we think need to hear the message of GVI, that we want them safe, alive, and free, but the violence is intolerable, that there are services to help them, but that the law enforcement community is going to be taking a very particular look at group violence because we believe it drives our violence. And so we look at the time frame in between our two traditional call-ins, which happened in May, and then a second one in September. Um, so the summer months also because of natural nature here in Minnesota is oftentimes when we see a peak in violence, particularly around gun violence. So we look at that as a demonstration period. In the year before GVI, we had 93 group member involved shootings um, that were non-fatal, which is really, when you think about it, just astronomical. Um, for a city the size of Minneapolis to have 93 people that we know of being shot as a result of gang violence is really problematic, in my opinion. One is too many, but 93 is is a lot. Um, in the year that we were able to implement, we had 42 group member involved shootings. So pretty significant reduction in that time period. We are very careful to say that we don't think that we can take full and absolute credit for that. Programs like Next Step and other initiatives we believe have an impact on the number of shootings as well. But to see such a dramatic reduction, particularly the group that we're focused on, we believe is an indication that GVI is having a significant impact. And in 2018, we saw that number drop to 25. And then in 2019, we had a slight uptick by two, which is significant, insignificant as far as the data is concerned, but any shooting we want to count and, and be thinking about why. And I think that 2019 is a particularly important year to focus on. And the reason being is that we know we did see in our city some increases in violence and we did see some increases in overall gun violence. And I think it's particularly important to look at the number around group member involved shootings for that year, because what it says is that we are consistently seeing reductions in this particular form of shooting violence. And that, that means there are other forms of violence we really have to look at and begin to address. And so a little later in my presentation, I will be talking about our intimate partner violence 
violence intervention strategy because it is one of the forms of violence where we saw some increases. And so the Office of Violence Prevention is recognizing that we are doing some really important work in certain areas of violence and that there's a lot of work yet to be developed and designed to address the breadth of the problem in Minneapolis. Next slide, please. So in the model, we have served over 230 participants um, belonging to over 35 groups and gangs. And so that, again, is important because I know that we are looking at expanding this model and have begun the expansion work into the south side of Minneapolis. But the 35 gangs really indicates that this has not ever been just a north side model, that we have always been taking and receiving uh, people who are struggling with the issue of gang involvement from across the city, um, while we have had a traditional service set in North Minneapolis, we've always been willing to serve a wide range of group members, which is why 35 groups have been served thus far, even though we're just really getting um, on the ground in a South Side social service model that's located in the South Side. The GVI model really looks at keeping people safe, alive, and free, which is a pivot from traditional social services. And the reason that that is so important is because what we know is that looking at the partnership, law enforcement has existed for a very long time, as have social services, and both of them by themselves doing what they've always done has not gotten to a solution around this particular population. And so being able to think about this to some degree as a harm reduction model and saying, we want to meet people where they're at. We are very careful to say we are not in the business of making model citizens. We are really about keeping those who are most likely to be impacted by gun violence safe from harm, alive, alive is essential, and free. And free is an important element um, to the model because we know that the rates of incarceration for um, black and brown communities and young men in particular are, partic are, are really high. And we want to be diligent about keeping people who step into this program free from incarceration, not only as a result of their gang involvement, but we know that there is a, trick you know, a trickle down effect, that people who are involved with violence because of gangs aren't just shooting and being involved in violence as a result of gang retaliatory violence, but that that violence tends to bubble up in lots of places in their lives. And so the case management element is really important because they are really helping them think about violence as an acceptable form of conflict resolution in every aspect of their life, not not just as it pertains to gang violence. And so that is very important to us in the way that we do our work. Next slide, please. I think that might be it for me. So at this time, we are pivoting. Um, we are doing some new and innovative things, not only locally, but really nationally, as we're building things out with John Jay. Um, so the South Side work, I want to um, shout out David Carson, who is in the audience here and does work with the Minneapolis Fire Department, but is also the executive director of an organization called Cause and Effect. And he has come on board with us as a contractor to help us develop the work on the South Side. He has brilliant relationships um, in Little Earth, as well as with other parts of the community, both Native American and African American communities in that arena. So we're really excited about um, what that is going to bring to the table and our ability to meet the needs of those communities. The health department has also hired a specialist to work um, in the Somali community. Right now, the tasks that that person will be responsible for don't include violence prevention, but we are working on buying out some of that person's time in order to have a targeted person focused on the East African community as it pertains to big picture of violence prevention. So it may not be just GBI, but we think that having someone with deep ties in that community is going to really help us to build out a model that will meet the needs of the East African community, an emerging community, um, particularly experiencing things around group violence. And so we're excited about those changes. The other piece that I think we're really, really excited about and that Jamil Jackson is here to talk with us about is the expansion of a GVI junior model. So historically, GVI has really focused on an adult population of 18 plus. And what we're recognizing now, particularly in talking with our partners in Minneapolis Public Schools, is that we are seeing an increasing problem or maybe a, a persistent problem around guns and gangs in our Minneapolis public schools and other schools and just generally with young people. Our partners in probation have expressed a need, um, whether young people are actually already engaged with guns and gangs or we can see the writing on the wall. The public health approach really says that we need to get involved and we need to do something before it becomes unmanageable. And so Jamil has wonderful relationships with young people across the city, and we're very excited to have him and his organization on board to help us as we design that work. At this time, I'd like to invite him to the podium to talk a little bit more about that project area. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, thank you, Chairman. 
and members of the committee. Uh, again, my name is Jamel Jackson. I run an organization called CEO, which stands for Change Equals Opportunity. Uh, the focus of our organization is to focus on young men of color ages 12 to 25 in the areas of education, employment, and life skills. Um, and through that work, um, I also run a basketball league called Run and Shoot, in which we kind of use uh, sport as the carrot to bring the young men in and focus on CEO sessions. CEO sessions, we also focus on uh, the exposure to college, career, and culture. In those pillars, uh, college, our focus is on financial aid literacy. Um, we do college tours in state and outstate, um, ACT prep, and we also have a care package program that we do for our our young people that are a part of CEO, where we actually send care packages to them in college uh, monthly. Um, our career component of that, we have a Quest program, and that Quest program, we focus on bringing that individual in, kind of doing an individual assessment on where they're at and where they're trying to go in life, uh, helping them identify if college is the best route for them or if technical, career, trade, whatever it may be, and then um, stay with them on their journey as they go. Um, our cultural aspect is historic tours, um, cultural trauma uh, conversations, um, and just trying to get them to understand where they're at. Our focus with CEO is um, becoming the CEO of you. Um, I myself am an, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, and so gravitating to some of these young men and showing them that college might not be for you, but there are other opportunities and avenues that you can be successful in life. Uh, I've partnered with GVI and Sasha Cotton for a number of years now uh, through my work in the community. I'm also uh, the head basketball coach at Patrick Henry High School, and I, right, and I um, am an instructor. We don't call ourselves teachers. We call ourselves classroom coaches, actually, uh, with the Office of Black Male Student Achievement within Minneapolis Public Schools. And so I run into a lot of these young men uh, throughout the community that I see within my schools and my work outside the school kind of mirrors the work we do in school, right? In school, I'm focusing on academics and behavior, but outside school, I can focus on socialization and uh, the community aspect. Um, so that's pretty much me. Great, thank you so much for all the work you do. Thank you, and our last piece about the tertiary work is around our intimate partner violence intervention strategy, which is another model that we've been talking with John Jay College about, and that graciously, and thank you to the council, there were some dollars allocated in the budget for this year for us to begin piloting that work. Slide, please. So the intimate partner violence um, accounts for a large portion of the violence that we see here in Minneapolis. And again, speaking to the, the group violence intervention strategy, we know that by no means do we have that problem completely figured out, but we think that we do have some really good tools to help people who are group involved. So it's time for us to explore some of the other issues in our city and make sure that we're able to respond to them in a way that is equally meaningful. The effects of IPV are particularly damaging because we know that exposure to childhood violence is one of the precursors to being involved in violence later in life. And intimate partner violence is often one of those exposures that young people have that can be very formative around their ideas about violence and using it as a tool for conflict resolution. So we think it's particularly important to be working with families on the issue of intimate partner violence so that we have a safer and healthier Minneapolis in the future and that we're also addressing the needs in the immediacy of right now. Uh, the 2020 city budget, as I said, did account for some dollars for us to begin this work, and so we are excited. We have already begun to negotiate some work with John Jay College, and they will be here in the spring to begin doing an audit. The audit is particularly important, I think, to the model overall, and what it does is begin to look at all of the incidents that are coded as domestic violence by our police department. Um, and every city that is doing this model does an audit. It's really important to being able to say that we're standing on a research-based model, that we're not just arbitrary saying, oh, well, the Cunningham family has always had domestic violence problems, so we better focus on them, but that they we're really looking at a data set that gives us an idea of how we can support families who have the deepest needs and individuals who are most likely to be batters or involved in intimate partner violence. The other reason I think in a jurisdiction like Minnesota that audit is particularly important is that our state statute says that all in, anything that happens in a dwelling gets coded as domestic violence, which means that it could be roommates or siblings or intimate partners that get um, labeled in this category of domestic violence, which makes it very difficult when we think about service provision because services for two siblings fighting or a mother and a child fighting are very different than 
a romantic relationship. And so we want to be sure and clear about what the data is telling us when we're looking at codes for domestic violence and making sure that we're able to deploy the right kind of resources when families are struggling with this issue, whether it be intimate partner or some other form of what gets coded as domestic violence. So we're very excited. Minneapolis will be one of the first cities to really do the, put some teeth on this model. And so we're excited to continue the trend of innovation around domestic violence in a state like Minnesota, which has been a real jet setter on the issue of domestic violence and to bring something that looks at um, holistic approaches to helping families who are dealing with this issue. So we will continue to pro provide updates, but it is another realm of violence that we are seeing our work transition into now that we are officially the Office of Violence Prevention. And with that, I will conclude that we do have a list of all of the presenters here on the slide and are happy to take any additional questions that you all may have. Thank you so much for that presentation, and I am really looking forward to getting into the intimate partner and domestic violence work. So thank you for including that as well. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? All right, seeing none, thank you all so much for being here. Um, thank you for the work that you do. Um, I know that you are able to see the work every day that you're doing and the impact that you have, but I also want to say the city council sees it too. Um, and so thank you for, for being here, um, giving us the space to be able to raise and praise the work that you do um, and recognize that, uh, that we see you, we appreciate you, and we are going to keep doing what we can to be able to support the work that you lead. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Director Cotton. Thank you, Josh. Uh, with that... Thank you. Seeing no further business before this committee, we are adjourned. Yeah. So the council chair is going to stick around. Oh, okay. Receiving file. Yeah.